Hello, everyone, and welcome to What's New in Historical Fiction, a virtual panel series that uh, talks to historical novelists with new and upcoming titles. I'm so excited that you could join us. Um, I'm going to, I forgot to change that uh, security setting. Give me just a second here. Um, so anyways, uh, I'm so glad that you could join us. We have some really great panelists here, and I'm going to have them introduce themselves in just a couple minutes before I do. Um, let me go over just quickly some of the details here. Um, so uh, we have these four great panelists. I'm going to ask them about their books. Uh, we'll have a, a discussion with them um, about the characters and, and, and uh, why they wrote their books and things like that. Um, and then after about 45 minutes, I will invite questions from the audience and you can ask your question in the chat. Um, for now, if you are uh, one of the attendees, please feel free to say hello in the chat and let us know where you're joining us from. Uh, the event will be recorded and I will be putting it up on YouTube later today when the recording is done. Um, I also have a landing page where you can find all, all of the novels that the authors are going to be talking about. Um, and those uh, that will show each one of our panelists' books, and it we link it to bookshop.org. If you're not familiar with bookshop.org, it is a bookseller, an online bookseller that gives money back to independent bookstores. Um, and when you buy a book on bookshop.org, you can actually choose, you can select which store you want to support. And also um, History Through Fiction, it's an affiliate link. So we actually get a small percentage of that sale. And of course, you'll be supporting the author and hopefully they get their royalties from that. Um, so without further ado, um, I'm going to move myself to the top of the screen and then we'll have our panelists introduce themselves. So give me just a second. Okay, uh, Lucy, if you could say hello and let us know, um, uh, tell us about your book. Sure. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining. Um, my book is called The Brickworks, and it covers the period 1879 to 1909. And it's about two young Scots who immigrate um, first to the United States and then on to Canada, and they establish a brickworks and um, change the community um, in which they live. Um, it's got a lot of um, history. It starts with the fall of the Tay Bridge in 1879 in Scotland. And um, there's a fair bit of technology and a little bit of romance. Um, it was a wonderful um, experience to research and write, and I, I'm really hoping people enjoy reading it. Thank you so much, Lucy. Yeah, I'm excited to talk to you more about your book. The event. Um, I forgot to if, I forgot to put a setting in Maybe that make sure that people were uh, muted. So if you have your mic open, if you're one of the attendees, please just mute yourself, um, and yeah, we'll just keep the mics open for our panelists. Okay, Teresa, if you could say hello and uh, let us know about your book. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Glad you're here. Uh, my name is Teresa Jansen, and uh, the historical fiction I've written is called The Ways of Water. Uh, it is uh, inspired by my grandmother's young life in the Southwest in the early 1900s. Her father was a steam locomotive engineer, and because of that, it meant they were itinerant family moving from place to place. Uh, part of her childhood, she was in old Mexico at the beginning of the revolution, but much of it was spent at the Jornada del Muerto, which is part of the old Camino Real in New Mexico. Uh, a tragedy when she was 14 years old meant that she was on her own from the age of 15, uh, trying to make a life, make a way in the old Southwest. So she experienced world war, boom and bust, mm. and the influenza uh, pandemic. Uh, it ends in San Francisco, uh, where she finally uh, comes to terms with her life and um, makes uh, uh, choices uh, for a happier future. Thanks, Teresa. Yeah, it, it definitely covers a lot in, in your novel. I look forward to talking to you more about that. Uh, Allison, if you could say hello and tell us about your book. 
Absolutely. Hi, everybody. I'm Allison Epstein coming from Chicago this uh, afternoon to me. And um, my book is called Let the Dead Bury the Dead. I have to show you because I love my cover so much. I have to show it to everybody. Um, it is set in 1812 St. Petersburg, Russia. It's an alternate history that tells the story of three different characters from all walks of life, from royalty, from military, and from a, a popular uprising in the city as they all navigate their way through the post-Napoleonic War era and figure out what they each can do in their own walks of life to make uh, a better future for the country of Russia. And just thanks to Colin for inviting me to chat with you all today and for all of my fellow panelists and their wonderful, wonderful books. Really excited to chat with you all today. Thanks, Allison. Yeah, I want to talk to you more about some of the alternative um, aspects of your novel. Uh, Joey, if you could say hello and tell us about your book. Well, hi, I'm Joey Davidow, and I'm just delighted to be here with all of you and with my uh, fellow writers. All of your books sound like something I want to read. My book is called Anything But Yes, Anna Del Monte, Jewess of Rome, 1749. She was 18 years old when she was um, abducted and thrown into a place called the House of Converts where the attempt was made to forcibly convert her. And as I was looking for my next protagonist, my next book, I came across her diary, which was discovered in 1985 in a, by an a Italian scholar in a library in Israel. And he published it in Italian. I was able to find the book um, and get a copy of it from the Bear Books dealer online. And I started to translate it. And then I started to do some more research because I had to put it in the context of Rome, of the papal states, of the ghetto. What was the ghetto culture? What was the Catholic church culture? Who were the popes? Who was her family? I was able to find a census shortly before my uh, the, the year she was abducted so I could see who everybody was in the ghetto, what their names were, where they lived, what were their... Um, family associations, and that's how it started. And years later, that book was finally published on October 6th. So it's brand new. And, Thank you know, you. It's, the, it's, it's, the, it's the struggle between two, between two uh, opposing faiths, both Anna and everyone she deals with in the House of Converts believes unfailingly that they're right. So for me, it was it was fascinating from that point of view. And also that here's the story of an 18 year old girl who has the courage to go up against the hierarchy of the Catholic Church, who have such complete power over her and her men older than her father. So. So that's also that's what my book's about. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Joey. And let's let's actually just continue with you. You talked a little bit about discovering the story. Uh, so who who was Anna Del Mont? I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, and you know, what were you able to learn about her life? And then I'm also curious to know more about the abduction abduction of Jews in Rome at this time. Was that something that was new to you? And what did you learn about it? Okay, Anna Del Monte was the daughter of um, a prominent family in the ghetto. Everybody in the ghetto was poorer than everybody not in the ghetto. But her family was less poor because um, until 1688, they had been able to have a banking license. So her families were bankers. And so they made lots of money until that was taken away from them. And then her father figured out that Jews were, uh, they were uh, barred from every profession, but they were allowed to sell used things. That was the only thing. And her father thought, well, antiques are used things. And at that time, um, the church was naming a lot of uh, new members of the aristocracy. They were giving people titles left and right and as favors in exchange. And there were a lot of empty palaces in Rome. So these newly named noble nobility would get one of these palaces, but then they would have to furnish it and fill it with all sorts of quote unquote family heirlooms family portraits, and they bought all this stuff from her father. And so he he wasn't just nobody. So she 
had a certain feeling about herself. She had also been allowed to read Plato and Aristotle and learn um, Greek and Latin. And so she was much more educated. So that, I think, gave her a lot of strength. First, the idea that she was a little bit above the average in her family, and then that she had that education. And um, I forget your second question. <laughs> Well, about her abduction and how common that was. Well, that what happened was in 1555, during the Council of Trent, when the church was terrified of losing Catholics to Protestantism, a pope was elected named Palafort, who was a Fara by family, and that's one of the prominent families and of Rome. And um, he was a very strict guy, and he really very doctrinaire, and he decided that he was going to make a um, make all the Jews go into a ghetto and and build a wall around it and lock them in there from sunset to sun uh, sundown to set up <laughs> to sun up so he wrote a papal bull called uh, Nimun absurdum which which states it's terribly absurd and completely inconvenient that the Jews are living all amongst us in some of the best neighborhoods, hiring good Catholics to be their servants and, you know, employees, and without showing proper gratitude that they're allowed to live, right? And he put a lot of restrictions on Jews. He thought that within a couple of generations, all the Jews would convert because it would be so miserable for him, for them there. And they kept making it more and more miserable. So when that didn't work, it became much more common to try to forcibly convert people. So those abductions came about um, around that time, and they continued for 200 years, 300 years, with more and more um, ability to abduct people. So they would start out with, you could be abducted because you were um, denounced or because you were offered. So the denunciation meant somebody heard you say something about how you wished you were Catholic, anything like that. And then they would go to the to the to the uh, tribunal and sign with two witnesses an affidavit saying that they heard you say that you wanted to be converted and you would be forcibly taken from your home. The other way was um, you could be offered. So sometimes people voluntarily converted. It was rare. Because if you voluntarily converted, or if you converted, period, forcibly or, or otherwise, you were from that day on un, um, forbidden to see any other Jewish person or to get within so many yards of the ghetto. That meant you would never see your mother, your father, your sons and daughters, anybody. So that was very unattractive to people, and they didn't convert. But some people who were very poor converted because you also got, there was a carrot and a stick. And the carrot was you got a, a lump sum of money. You got allowed into a guild so you could make a living. They would find you a nice Catholic wife or husband. But then you would be watched for the rest of your life because they were so terrified of recidivism. So you were never really free. But if you were starving in the worst part of Rome, where the Tiber River flooded your house every so many years, you might consider converting just because to survive. So once you converted, then you were expected to make an offering to the church. And the offering could be one of your relatives. It could be anybody over whom you had some power. So they made that more and more loose. So at first, a father could offer his daughter, he could offer his wife. Then a grandfather could offer his grandchild over the objections of the parents. And it went from there. So it was not an odd thing for Anna to be abducted. She had seen a friend of hers abducted. Um, it didn't happen every day, but it happened. That's that's just incredible. And, you know, I, I knew little to nothing about that. So, you know, how great for you to kind of humanize that history with, with your novel. Yeah, well, that's what I'm trying to do, because even in Rome, people don't know these stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Colin, just to add, if I may, sure. I had always assumed that that kind of anti-Semitism was unique to Germany, 
um, you know, during the Second World War. Um, so finding out that you can trace it back to the 1500s is just shocking to me. Anti-Semitism was common all over Europe, probably all over the world. Um, but it, it was fine until Christianity came in. The Jews first came to Rome as, as um, merchants, and they lived with Muslims and and uh, pagan, I guess you would call them, Ita Italians in peace and harmony. But um, around the fifth century, the Emperor Constantine converted to Catholicism and decided that should be the official religion of Rome, of, of, of the whole Roman Empire. So anybody who didn't convert, because it wasn't such a big deal to be, you know, remember they were feeding Christians to the lions just shortly before that. <laughs> anybody who didn't convert suffered and the Jews didn't convert. So wow. at a certain point, they got it. Well, it's certainly an important topic, especially right now. And, and we, you know, we could spend the whole time talking about that. Um, but I'll encourage people to pick up your novel to learn more of those details. And I'm so glad you're able to share those with us right now. Uh, but let's get on to some of our other panelists' novels. Uh, so Lucy, you wrote about the Tay Bridge disaster. So what yes. inspired you to, to write a novel about that? Well, <clears throat> the Tay Bridge um, in Scotland in 1879 was two miles long. And it went across the um, Firth of the Tay from Dundee towards Edinburgh. It was considered a marvel of Victorian engineering. At two miles long, it was the longest bridge in the world. And what happened um, was that it was erected quite quickly. And during the winter storm in December of that year, <clears throat> the, the bridge failed and the bridge plunged into the Tay, killing everybody on board the train. And it was believed um, originally that the train driver was, was to blame for taking the bridge too quickly in the storm. And years later, after many inquests and examinations, um, they realized that the bridge had not been assembled um, as, as it should have been. The piers weren't sunk deep enough. They hadn't used all of the rivets. They hadn't tested for weight load at the same time that they tested for force. So the, the combination of all those factors was why the bridge failed. And it's a story that interested me because we continue to have bridge failures in the world, as you know. I mean, there was a huge bridge in Italy that failed. We had a huge bridge disaster in Quebec. There have been bridges failing in the United States. And, and some of the reasons for those bridge failures are very much the same. Um, as, as the Tay Bridge, lack of maintenance, lack of inspection, a whole series of factors. So that was intriguing to me. But the story actually started um, with brickworks. And um, my husband and I had gone for a Sunday drive and we stumbled across the ruins um, in the Caledon area here in Ontario of what I thought was a woolen mill. And uh, we hiked over to it and discovered it was actually the ruins of an old brickworks. And I thought to myself, I don't know anything about brick making. Um, how curious that this is here. And I picked up a shard of brick and took it home and put it on my writing room desk. And that little piece of brick just spoke to me. And I thought, well, there was a huge fire in Toronto that that wiped out much of the downtown core. And the little village, the town that I live in, Port Perry, had two massive fires um, in 1883 and 1884. And each time I knew that there had been these fires, um, people rebuilt the towns using brick. And I thought, well, how did they get the technology um, to build bricks? Where did that come from? Um, and so I started doing research and, and discovered that, you know, small towns all over this country had built their own brickworks um, so that they wouldn't have to ship the bricks. And people somehow knew how to build bricks and, and how to rebuild, um, you know, cities and villages using local brick making. And um, 
And that was a story that really interested me in terms of what I call a progressivist ideology. Um, just this understanding at the end of the Victorian era, going into the Edwardian period, where science and technology make everything possible. And um, the more reading I did and the more research I did, um, I became really convinced that there was an important story here. So I, I went to Scotland, I learned about the Tay Bridge, I learned about brick making in Saskatchewan, and um, interviewed engineers. And um, it, the pieces just all came together. And I just had these two young men pop into my head, um, full of a vision of how they could change the community in which they lived and, and what that would mean. Well, that's, that's amazing. Uh, you know, I never, I look at a brick, I never th thought about that. I think you took it a few steps further than the rest of us might. Uh, but how fascinating that that led you all the way to writing that story. Thank you. Well, Teresa, let's go to you. Um, you wrote The Ways of Water, uh, and it's a, a family story. It's about your grandmother. So tell us about your grandmother, Josie Bell Gore, and what inspired you to write about her. Okay, well, here's the, the cover. And uh, the cover has a picture of my great aunt on it. Um, when my grandmother was still alive, I had foresight to interview her. And I was young, um, but asked her many, many questions and wrote notes. And uh, fortunately, there's a collection of family photos and other family members also spoke to her about her childhood. And the more I learned about it, I became just fascinated in what she uh, experienced before the age of 21. So she was born in 1901 in uh, the Southwest. She grew up uh, in the Jornada del Muerto, which is uh, east of the Rio Grande. It's the route, part of the Camino Real that, that was established for a route originally by the Spanish between uh, Mexico City and uh, um, Santa Fe. But uh, her father was a, a railroad engineer, steam locomotive, and the family followed him around from place to place having an itinerant life. Uh, but she lived in the, these first two decades of the 20th century, which were uh, just really a lot of change happening in our country then, and she experienced all that. Uh, so a lot of it is about the desert and uh, survival uh, with and without water. Uh, and then a tragedy, a family tragedy occurred when she was 14. And from the age of 15, she was on her own, trying to make her way in a man's world. Uh, we talk about uh, women's issues and uh, women's journey at that time. And uh, through thick and thin, uh, many twists and turns, she finally made her way to uh, San Francisco, uh, where she has to make peace with her past. And uh, so it's it's a, an odyssey, in a sense, a young girl's odyssey coming of age. And, and when did you kind of decide for yourself that this was a story that you wanted to tell? I went to the Jornada del Muerto. I tried to find the graves of my great-grandparents. Uh, where they lived, it's now ghost towns. Uh, so there was little left, just remnants of a fence. And uh, at that point, I, I saw that my great grandmother had died there at the age of, thir age of 36. And I think that was the seed. It's like, what was this all about? What, you know, <laughs> we're talking about generational trauma. And, you know, you write to make sense of things. So for me, it was a personal journey to make sense of, of this story. Um, and so it went from there. I think that's that's great. Now let's go to Allison. Allison, your book is set in 1812 St. Petersburg. Can you tell us more about the setting, both the political and historical context, and why did you write a novel set at that time and place? Absolutely. Yeah. So. Yeah, the book is set right after Napoleon's failed invasion of Moscow, kind of at the end of the Napoleonic Wars, right about now. He's 
just realize, oh, you actually can't invade Russia during the winter, famously. And so his army turns around and begins the long march back to France, which is kind of where in most of the historical novels that I've read, the camera sort of follows Napoleon on his way back. There's lots of really wonderful historical fiction that really zeroes in on Napoleon. But for me, I was interested what happened in the aftermath of that. What does it look like when you won a war, technically Russia had defeated Napoleon, but at what cost? The uh, Napoleonic invasion of Russia was absolutely devastating. Um, it resulted in famously the citizens of Moscow set the city on fire rather than let Napoleon take it from them. And I think that's really emblematic of, you know, they would not give in regardless of how much it costs. So there's a victory there, but it does not feel in that city like the war has been won. And the suffering of the Russian people during that time obviously was not equally distributed. Um, the army that largely pushed Napoleon back had been um, really across the entire society of Russia at that time. It had been noblemen, it had been peasants, it had been everybody taking up arms to defend the country. But when that invasion was over, they're going back to the extremely socially stratified world of the empire that they had been in before. Both peasants and noblemen had died fighting for their country, but at the end, noblemen were allowed to go back to their beautiful palaces and peasants were going back to very little to nothing. And so that sense of social unease in the wake of a victory was really, really interesting to me. And it was a place that I wanted to spend time in. Um, I had, I think like many of us, when we were trapped inside during COVID, wanted to read the largest and most impressive book that we could find to pass the time. And for me, that was War and Peace. It was uh, the second time that I had read it, but one of my very favorite books, regardless of how pretentious that may sound, I love it so much. Um, and it just got me thinking again about this moment in history that I've always been really interested in and kind of really resonated with me in a way that you know, spoke really closely to what was going on in the US where I am during that time, that sense of unrest and upheaval where no one quite knows what's going to happen next. And so I, it seems odd to say I found a lot of modern parallels in 1812 St. Petersburg, but really did as I was writing it. Well, I think all of us can relate to that, doing the research that we do, that the, yeah, the history is definitely relatable, sometimes unfortunately. But let's stick with you, Allison. So you told us a little bit about this history. How about the characters? How did you bring the history to life? Yeah, the, I am. I think of myself as a character writer. I love the research of historical fiction, but if I can't map it onto a person that I really love and really care about, I have a hard time sticking with the project. And so for Let the Dead Bury the Dead, I have three point of view characters who I love with all my heart. They're very different and all of their stories kind of interact in different ways. Um, as I was saying, kind of in the, in the intro of the book, they're coming at it from three different strata of society sort of um one of the characters his name is felix and he is the second son of the czar he's the grand duke with all of the power that comes along with that he's living a very privileged very um distanced life from all of the suffering that i was talking about a moment ago he's just living in his palace having his parties having a wonderful time um that's a really fun character for me to write personally i enjoy writing a person who's just here to have a good time <laughs> Um, the uh, One of the other characters, his name is Sasha, and he is just come back from the front fighting Napoleon. So he is an army captain who's experienced that invasion firsthand. And so obviously he's coming at the post-war period with a very different lens than Felix would be. He understands it in a more visceral way. And the third character, her name is Maria, and she is um, at the right-hand person of a popular rebellion that's kind of fomenting in the streets of St. Petersburg. So she is, I think of her kind of as the activist of the characters. She sees the problems that both, that Sasha knows about and Felix kind of doesn't want to see, but she's the one who's on the ground trying to take action. And all three of their stories, as they do start to intersect like when things go terribly wrong for all three of them, they must find a way to work together and not against each other to kind of work toward common goals. But it was really fun for me to think about three very different voices in these characters and three very different backgrounds. It felt like I was able to open up the world a little bit more by coming at it from three different narrators. I will say it's extremely 
complicated to write three different narrators. And there were many times in revisions, I was like, why did I do this to myself? But very happy with where it ended up. Yeah, but then, yeah, I like what you said about it opened up the world more to you, but I can understand how that would be very challenging as well. Joey, let's go back to you. Um, you already gave us some really deep history, um, and I imagine that that's part of your background as a journalist is doing the research. Um, and I can see by your bookshelf behind you, you've got a lot of <laughs> information um, scattered about. So uh, tell us about your your experience as a journalist and how that helps you be a better novelist. Well, it only helps me to be a better novelist because it taught me how to do research and how to like research. It was hard because this is a challenge that historical novelists go through is that we're actually writing fiction, but we have to stick to the facts. So how do you do that, right? I mean, I didn't want to say that they had their morning coffee if people in those days couldn't afford to have coffee or they didn't have coffee yet. I didn't want to say anything wrong. I wanted it all to be as true as it could be, but I still had to give myself permission to make things up. It's fiction. So this is this tightrope that we all walk. And I think having been a journalist with, you know, having to be exactly correct and get two sources and, you know, double check everything was hard. But what I say in the beginning of my books is whatever is known was is real. But I made up the part that we couldn't know. Right. It's what we couldn't know that I can. That's where I can be a fiction writer or I have yeah. to be. Because somebody famous said that historians tell us what happened, but historical fiction writers tell us how it felt. So what I'm writing is not what happened, but what happened to my characters. And that's the difference. Yeah, and I see uh, Nina says that's a good disclaimer. So that's great. Uh, Lucy, let's go back to you. Um, you talked about, you, you, you know, you had to do a lot of research for understanding brickworks. You, you're not experienced in that. Um, you said you talked to some engineers, you traveled to Scotland. So you, can you tell us more about the in-depth process of learning the engineering and then bringing that out through your characters in your novel? Well, <laughs> I think like the other writers here, I love the research part. Um, so that for me was really fun. Um, I discovered that there was um, a historic brick plant in Claybank, Saskatchewan here in Canada. And um, so I flew out to Saskatchewan for three days with my partner and learned um, about brick making. Um, and that was just an incredible experience. Um, I also interviewed um, a couple in our community um, whose family owned a historic brick plant in the community and um, read a number of papers um, by an archaeological company um, who specialize in excavating um, sites. And um, one gentleman in particular, one archaeologist in particular, um, had a specialty in um, excavating brickwork sites and um, determining um, the age of buildings, etc., cetera, um, by examining bricks. And uh, his work was really interesting to me. He actually endorsed the book before it was published, um, which was a real honor for me. So there was that whole aspect of brick making, but I also needed to learn about bridge making and um, was um, started off as most of us would do by reading books. And um, then I had the good fortune to encounter a civil engineer who had spent his career building bridges um, throughout the world. And so he was very generous with his time. And um, I sat down with him originally with my research and talked about what I was hoping to accomplish. And um, he gave me lots of ideas and um, then when I had written first draft, I extracted the bridge related pages and shared those with him, which he critiqued and helped me to fine tune. 
Um, so it was a real learning experience for me. Um, we went to Scotland um, because I wanted um, to learn more about the Tay Bridge and discovered that new bridges um, had been built on the piers of the original 1879 bridge and was able to take a train across the new Tay Bridge and um, did quite a bit of research there at the National Museum. Um, but while we were there, I also encountered um, jute mills um, in Dundee, and I didn't know anything um, about the importance of jute um, to the Scottish economy um, during the same period of time. And so that was another rabbit hole I went down, and um, it's also included in the book. But it was just so much fun to, in, to uncover um, these rich areas of history and um, to share them with my characters and bring them to life for readers. Lucy, can I ask you a question? What, sure. what did it feel like going across the reconstructed bridge that you had been reading about all that? That must have been such a strange experience for you. <laughs> <laughs> it was incredible to tell you the truth, Allison. I was with my husband and there was a whole bunch of commuters on the train. They were obviously on their way to work. And suddenly I looked out the window and I could see the Firth of the Tay and I jumped up in my seat and I said, we're on it, we're on it, we're on the Tay Bridge. And I started screaming, which is a little bit out of character. And all these <laughs> people looked up from their newspapers and sort of <laughs> like, what is with this woman? But it was exciting. It was really amazing. There's something about traveling that same ground, Lucy, that your character, be they fiction or real, traveled. It almost gives you goosebumps. Completely, completely. Uh, yeah. And and one of the things, I don't, I don't know if any of you have, have been to Dundee in Scotland, but they have this living history museum called Verdant Works. And it's um, a jute mill that they have rolled back in time and turned into a living museum. And it's just an incredible experience. You truly feel as though you have walked back, you know, to the 1870s. And it's just so easy to imagine your characters in that space. Thank you, Lucy. Yeah, you really, you really demonstrated for us all the work that goes into being a historical novelist. Uh, well, I have a question here from Nina for Teresa, and it was something I had in my notes as well. Um, can you talk about the struggle of bringing your your grandmother to life on the page, and you know, and your whole family? Really, what were there parts that you didn't want to fictionalize, or parts that you struggled with with putting on the page? That's a great question. You know, I taught history for many years in high school. And one of um, my goals was to bring it to life, often through stories of individuals. And that was one, one uh, goal for me in writing this was to bring a period to life. But yes, a lot of this was um, based on family oral history. And what happens with that uh, is that there's often inconsistencies. There are gaps, and I realized when I did interview my grandmother, not with a, a novel in mind, just because I was fascinated in her life, that uh, there were um, things I did not ask her that I should have, and there were connections I could make later on. So, um, so there were two things going on, me wanting to bring her voice to life, and having known her, I knew her personality and her uh, perspective. And so I tried to channel more her personality than always the exact facts because we couldn't know. It was also at that point when there were the inconsistencies and I realized I had to imagine a scene or imagine a conversation that may or may not have happened or in that way that I crossed that line, it was fiction. And in many ways um, that gave me the freedom to develop the plot line in a way uh, and sometimes I did have to create events that I thought might have led to the next. So I'm very clear this is this is historical fiction inspired by her life. Um, 
And, you, you know, I, I try to channel her energy in a sense uh, just to make sure that I was uh, true to the spirit of the family and the individuals and the people. And I think another thing with uh, historical fiction based on individuals you knew, you have to make decisions. When do you change a name? When do you keep a name? Uh, and there were people I knew that were in her life that I didn't know their personalities that well. In that case, I had to change a name because um, it would not be be true. So the only names I kept were uh, some family names. Well, I've got a, a couple more questions I want to get to. One for Teresa, one for Allison. Um, if you would like to start put it, posting your questions in the chat, um, I hopefully will be able to get to some of those. Um, but Teresa, let's continue with you. I'm curious to know more about water con uh, conservation. Uh, I want to know more about how valuable water was to the railroads in the Southwest. Um, and, you know, where are we at now compared to where we were then? Because now that, you know, there's, I don't know how many millions of people are living in the Southwest, but that's always a concern is, is availability of water. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, the theme of water runs through the novel in many different forms. Uh, it begins with a, a trip down a well. Um, in the steam locomotives, uh, the early, until about the 1930s, had to refill their water tanks every seven to 10 miles. So these little tiny tank towns or whistle stops, they called mm -hmm. them, developed all over the West, particularly, and especially through the deserts. And so these boom and bust towns grew up. And so this is part of the story of the, this economy. Um, but water runs through, uh, part of the book talks about the building of the first dam on the Rio Grande, the Elephant Butte Dam. And uh, so yes, it was an issue for the people then. And as we've seen through news, it is a continuing and growing issue, particularly in the Southwest. I think about half of the water in the Southwest comes from rivers and streams in East Southwestern cities and about half from groundwater. And we know that there are eight states and Mexico that all depend on the water from the Colorado River. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's great controversy over it. And it's actually been overpromised. They've allocated more than even exists. So I think we're going to see this theme of, of water and water rights uh, growing and and this novel just touches on some of the early issues. For example, when they put in the the Elephant Butte Dam, her father worked on the railroad uh, to bring supplies. Uh, every all the towns on the east side of the Rio Grande then died because a highway went in a highway went in on the left on the west side uh, for the new automobiles, and that was what developed. So these dams uh, then really changed the uh, environment and the local economies as they continue to do. Thank you, Teresa. Yes, yeah, such an important topic to talk about and, and hopefully it brings some awareness with your novel. So Allison, I wanted to talk to you about the alternate aspects of your novel. Um, you, you have some folklore in there. So talk about the decision to include that folklore. And I'm also curious to know, how does that help deepen the story and kind of using folklore to illuminate history? Yeah, um, the folklore is the aspect of this book I'm really passionate about. I'm a, I'm a historical fiction writer at heart, but I love reading historical fantasy. That's where I spend a lot of my recreational time. And so this book was kind of an opportunity for me to, to dip a toe into that that pool that I that I really enjoy. And for Russian history in particular, I think the idea of bringing folklore into history was particularly apt. Um, there's been sort of a, a dual culture in Russia since the first Christian missionaries kind of entered the country. And I think this is true in a lot of different cultures. I know most about it in, in Russia because of the absurd amount of research I did pre this book, but it's definitely a pattern that we see elsewhere is that kind of on the surface of things, when uh, a missionary force comes into a country, you know, people will adopt the state religion because it's dangerous not to. You will become a Christian because if you don't become a Christian, there are risks to your family, to your livelihood. Joey, I'm sure you know all about this in your research as well. 
Um, but that doesn't mean that people's minds actually change right away as soon as you, you can put on a front in a lot of ways or you can accept parts of a, a dominant belief, but that doesn't mean that what you believed before just goes away overnight like that. And in Russia, because so many of the small villages and um, rural towns are so far from big metropolises, it's really hard for culture to kind of spread out that way. And so in these small towns, there's been a really interesting history of Christianity and I guess pagan folk belief and folklore existing in a really interesting way side by side at the same time. You might have people celebrating Orthodox Christmas, but you still have those same people participating in, in folk religion, folk rituals, and believing really earnestly in uh, creatures of folklore. And so that was something that I found really interesting as I was researching this, this time period and something that I thought, okay, well, I would love to incorporate that into this book in some way, having the really concrete facts of 19th century Russia alongside this kind of blending of what's real and what's not real, what do people believe, what can be proven. And so partly that was why I made the book, the history within the book, alternate history, because I didn't want to, you know, once I'm starting to make up things about folkloric characters coming in and interacting with real historical figures, that starts to get dicey. And so I wanted to just kind of separate that from the proven facts. But everything within the book is inspired by real events in history and inspired by real folklore that existed at that time. So my author's note kind of goes through and makes those parallels to what is this based on? What is this drawn from? And how does it all kind of come together into one somewhat imagined, but still, I think, spiritually true picture of the time? And while you were speaking, Sarah had some more questions about that that research, and maybe you, you do um, answer some of them in your author's note. But can you talk a little bit about um the the language barrier and did, did you have to do any research in in russian or any kind of local languages gosh that is this is why i'm working on a third book right now and it's set in an english-speaking country because it's incredibly difficult um i did not speak russian before i started writing this book i've been trying to teach myself russian for several years um and i know some now i don't know enough to read a 19th century historical source regrettably i did not learn that much and so i have had to rely on translated sources, which introduces all kinds of, you know, biases and problems. You know, who's writing this source? Why are they translating it from? What translator bias is introduced? Are foreigners writing the source and what, what lens are they bringing to it? And so there was a lot of kind of reading between the lines I had to do with my sources. Is this a bias of the person who wrote it or is this an actual fact that happened? And that's really, really tricky to to unpack. But I think for me, at least I'm hoping being cognizant of it as I was writing helped me kind of avoid hopefully some of the biggest pitfalls in that, in that sort of work. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of things to consider. Now we have a question from Sarah about advice. Now all of you are practice writers. Um, so maybe Joey, you can start us out here. What advice would you have for somebody writing a, a a debut novel who's kind of maybe new to historical fiction? Well, if you want to write about historical fiction, be prepared to spend a lot of time on research. It's much easier to just make it all up, believe me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you're going to have to make a commitment. So be sure that you really, really love this story. And then make sure you get all your facts right. Because nothing is more disconcerting when you're reading a historical novel than to catch an anachronism. Um, I work as a freelance book editor. And so when I'm reading a, a manuscript by a historical novelist and they end up saying things like, um, oh, she, she thought outside the box or something like that. And it's supposed to take place in the 19th century. I get annoyed. So you have to make sure that not only are your facts right, but that your dialogue isn't going to be jarring. That doesn't mean you have to try to imitate 15th century English, but you have to give it that flavor and make sure you're not throwing in modern expressions. Um, so it's, it's a hard road. And um, so you just have, my advice is make sure you're doing something you really love and are willing to commit that much time to. 
any other any other of our panelists have advice for debut or new historical fiction authors? Yeah, I would um, add to that um, what Joy is saying, know your history, know your facts, but also know your genre. I think um, really good writers um, benefit by reading deeply and by reading widely, particularly in their genre. And each genre has its own conventions. And I think it's really um, beneficial um, to your work if you're familiar with your genre as well as your history and that you've done some deep reading and some wide reading. Lucy, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I tell my clients and my students that to be a good writer, you have to read a lot and you have to write a lot and that there are no shortcuts. And when they say, well, I only have time, barely have time to write, how am I gonna read? That's not gonna work. We learn how to be good writers by being, by reading good writers. Good writing is contagious and so is bad writing. So read a lot and be careful what you read. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I would understand. add uh, what Joey said and, and Lucy, uh, follow your passions. If you're really passionate about the topic, the research will come easy because one problem for us sometimes is stopping the research uh, because mm -hmm. we are so very interested in getting down to the writing. It's finding that balance between uh, over-researching and then uh, spending your time on the development of the story. Um, so, you know, that's one. The other thing that often comes not by, uh, comes uh, by a surprise are connections with every day. And we, we talked, I think there are connections in all of our uh, books with everyday issues and politics and social uh, issues too. And uh, you don't have to be explicit in your novel, but I do think readers uh, enjoy those connections. Uh, it can give us um, good perspective that maybe this isn't the first time something like this has happened and uh, the reader can take uh, more from it than just the story. Absolutely, Teresa, I was just going to say know when to stop researching. <laughs> That is <laughs> definitely a problem, and we can spend eight years researching a book that we never sit down to write because we enjoy the research so much. So knowing that eventually it is time to sit down and, and get to the page is important. Um, the other thing I would say is don't be afraid to do it. I hear from a lot of folks who find out that I write historical fiction. Like it, It's a daunting genre for a lot of people. I think the amount of research and the amount of, I guess, responsibility that we have to get it right can make people spend all of their time in research and never turn to the page because there's a feeling of, oh, I don't know enough yet to write this. Oh, I, I should be reading 12 more books and teaching myself three more languages before I get started. And I think giving ourselves the freedom to know that we're not gonna get everything right in our first draft, certainly, but we need to get something down on the page so that we can later go back and fix it and do supplemental research and you know, send it out as Lucy did to experts to get opinions on things like that. We, there has to be something there before we can polish it. So don't don't be intimidated by the amount of work. The work can be done in lots of different stages, but the, the writing has to happen too. Well, speaking more on that, we had a question from Nina earlier about after you did all your research and you started writing your novel, did any of you come to a point where you learned something new that you that made you kind of have to alter things, have to go back and alter part of your storyline? That didn't happen to me, although I could see where it would happen. Um, I think I felt like I knew my characters and I knew my story by the time I started writing. And so that didn't happen, but it, it can happen. It will happen to lots of people. No. One thing that happened with me, no, so my grandmother was a young woman in 1918 at the time of the influenza uh, epidemic. In fact, she nearly died of it. Uh, is I did all the research about the that pandemic long before COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I didn't dream that I would be living through some of the same things she did. In fact, one of the things I was amused with when I was doing my research was about um, 
people that went to a baseball game and all the fans and all the players wore masks. And I was just laughing, thinking, how could that be? And who could have guessed that years later after doing my research, I went to a baseball game wearing a mask, <laughs> giving muffled cries. So um, I think that uh, sometimes, you know, we do have these surprises. And uh, when our pandemic did come, I like I knew a lot about it. <laughs> I didn't quite have as many surprises as some, maybe. Funny and disconcerting, I'm sure, at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, for me, I think I had done enough research at the beginning that I didn't necessarily need to throw out, like, a plot line or a character or anything like that. But I, I will share the one I was most frustrated about is that I had written a whole little interlude in the second half of this book about the Russian ballet, which I thought for sure was a shoe, and I didn't need to look up what year the Russian ballet had been invented. So I could just really go in and write this beautiful scene that I loved. And then it turned out that I was 30 years too early for the Russian ballet. (laughs) If anyone wants a fact about the Russian ballet that I wasn't able to use in this book, you're more than welcome to it. I had to then go back and research the opera, which would have been the equivalent. But, you know, someday I'll write a book set 30 years in the future so I can use all of that information. Well, turn it into a short story, Allison. There we go. (laughs) (laughs) Um, One thing that happened to me with the brickworks, I will say, I was probably halfway through my first draft of 15 drafts for the Brickworks when I realized I needed a second character. Um, When I plotted the book, um, Alistair was my main character only. And partway through, I realized that he did not have the perspective or the education or the experience um, to help carry everything that that I wanted to communicate and so I had to invent his best friend Brody and go back to the beginning and insert Brody um so that happens sometimes I think we realize that we need another character or a character takes on more significance uh, a more prominent role in the in the trajectory I see head nodding. That makes me feel better. Yeah. <laughs> oh, every time, every time. Well, no, that's true. You know, my first question when I'm getting ready to write a book is whose book is it? Mm-hmm. And what do they want, right? And mm-hmm. sometimes you really don't know whose book it is until you're way into it. Somebody else just seems to take... I wrote a book about... Um, my last book before this one was about the opera singer Pauline Viardot and her love a long lifelong love affair with the uh Ivan Ivan Targenev the Russian author and I thought it was her book and also I was kind of afraid of Turgenev because he was a much better writer than I was <laughs> so, and but he kind of took over a lot of the book as I went through it so mm-hmm. you don't always know well, we're up against the end of the hour here. Um, like I said, this, this would go quickly. We only scratched the surface. Uh, I do want to ask one more question for uh, each of you. I always wrap things up asking about what is the value of historical fiction and why write fiction when I, it's clear that all of you have done enough research to write nonfiction. Uh, before I do that, let me r- remind people that um, if they want to pick up these books, um, there's a link there that I just posted in the chat where you can see each one of our panelists' books and you can buy them through bookshop.org. Um, I want to thank everyone for attending. I do want to thank those that this is a free event, but some people did make a donation to History Through Fiction. I really appreciate that because that helps pay for this platform and helps me continue to host events like this. So thank you so much for that. And again, um, I will post this to YouTube as, for, as a replay and I'll email all the attendees that link. So um, value of historical fiction, why write history through fiction? Lucy, if you could start us off. Um, For me, um, it allows me to amplify moments in the past that resonate through to the future. I talk about progressivist ideology. And for me, that matters when we're dealing with something like artificial intelligence currently. What, what have we learned about checks and balances that will stand us in good stead as we look at, at new innovation and how our lives are going to change? Thank you, Lucy. Very well said. Uh, Teresa, what are your thoughts? I think the value is really bringing uh, history to life. 
Um, it's mind boggling the amount of history, but if you can understand even one little piece, I think it can give you perspective and a uh, better understanding of our own times. The human condition hasn't changed. People have been the same all along. It's just the situations to realize that there was real people that felt and you know sensed just like you living through those historic times. Definitely. Allison, how about you? Why what's the value of historical fiction? Yeah, I think I think Julie, you said it already is that history tells you what happened and then historical fiction tells you how it felt. And I think that's so important. And it's what keeps drawing me back to this genre. Um, history is a beautiful place to lose yourself in in the research hole. But it can, I think for a lot of readers, it can start to feel dry and impersonal if you're looking through dates and names of battles and fact upon fact. I think we're, as humans, we're naturally wired to absorb information through story and through feeling and through things that are happening to other people. And so it's to me, so much easier to learn through historical fiction. It's what brings it to life and keeps me engaged. And Joey, anything you can add to that? Well, I totally agree with everything everybody else said. But um, for me also, the books I like the most and the books I try to write are um, human stories that are timeless, that resonate because we see oh my god 300 years ago 500 years ago 200 years ago they were people still were people and they still felt what they felt um so th um, when i think about my books in addition to thinking about what's the story who is it about what does she want i think what's the theme what's the theme of this and so the theme of of the last book on anything but yes the one that just came out is you know that nobody's wrong when two people are uh, are clashing their their most core beliefs, they're both right, and and it's that that's the tragedy that has caused so much misery in this world, yes. is that we just can't say okay you're right and I'm right have a nice life, you know, and so um, that's what I love about writing historical fiction. Yeah, yeah. How do we reconcile that? Well, thank you to our panelists. Congratulations on your new novels. And thanks again for everyone who attended. And I uh, hope wherever you are in the world that you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank thanks you so much, Colin, so much. Thank you so much, Colin. Thank you.